Okay, so now I get to talk about mutation testing and how it's done. Dr. Robles talked about the fun, targetable stuff. Now I get to talk about how, it's, how to actually do mutations in this and what we're talking about. So my objectives are to talk about mutation testing methodology in AML. We talk about NGS testing a lot. What does that mean? And I want to go over how to interpret, interpret an actual mutation panel results when you receive it. And I will talk a little bit about prognosis and what to do with this information in AML. So this is data from the, can, uh, the Cancer Genome Atlas, TCGA data set, and mutations are very common in AML. And I see where the organizers got the question from. Um, there's some, the most top five uh, mutated genes in the TCGA data set are FLIP3 at 20% in this data set, MPM1, DNMP3A, and the IDH1 and IDH2, which occur about in about 10% each of the patients with AML. And uh, RAS mutations are, occur in about 12% of patients with AML. This is pretty, pretty standard in, in a, a lot of other data sets. Um, the IDH mutations occur in about 10% of the time, 10% um, of patients with AML. So there's different methods to actually test for these mutations that we're talking about. Um, the most common way that we used to uh, test for mutations were is actually individual mutation testing using PCR. So these you have to um, order uh, individually and basically you do individual PCR for each gene and you get individual gene report. What is more common these days is something called next generation sequencing. Basically what this is is that you're basically sequencing in parallel and you have um, uh, amplicons and uh, primers from multiple genes and multiple spots and you're basically able to sequence them in parallel. And that's why you receive a panel of mutations in one test. That's why you get a panel of mutations for probably for solid tumor also that includes something like 440 plus genes and you get information on a lot of of genes. It doesn't cover the entire gene or exomes and something that is done in research setting in academic places is a whole exome sequencing where you can actually sequence an entire exome but this is not usually not done in commercially and this is done in academic setting and you do get a lot of information in across all of the exome but the coverage may be less than the next generation sequencing. What I did not put on this also is that in academic setting you can actually sequence entire gene which in entire genome, whole genome sequencing, which is rarely done um, except in special circumstances. So this is a nice uh, figure from a uh, review article that was published in New England Journal fairly recently, and it talks about next generation sequencing and genetic mutation testing in general. So at top, if you look at the DNA, um, if you remember biology, um, if you look at the DNA, there are coding sections called exons and introns. And the exons are uh, scattered throughout the gene, and the exons are the ones that combine and become a messenger RNA and become protein. So in the second column is Sanger sequencing, which is the same as the PCR that we know. And basically what that is, is you take individual piece, uh, primers and you have to uh, sequence individual sections uh, individually. The NGS panel, at, uh, third from the bottom, what it is is that basically you can take primers and amplicons. You, you can take many, many different uh, primers and you can actually um, uh, sequence many different exons uh, at the same time and basically you get different, uh, many different reads per, per section that you are actually sequencing. Um, this is exome sequencing where you're actually sequencing the uh, entire exome. So the difference between um, next generation sequencing and, and um, exome sequencing basically is that in next generation sequencing you are typically not covering the entire exome but you are actually um, selecting which parts of the gene and exome that exon that you're sequencing. So in next generation sequencing, it's actually commercially available and this is just a short uh, list of the different commercial laboratories that offer a myeloid directed um, next generation sequencing, something from ARUB, Foundation Medicine, Genoptics, LabCorp, Neogenomics, Quest, it goes on and on and uh, it is commercially available. Um, in academic settings, we do do it in-house, but if this is a testing that can be done commercially. 
One thing that to note is that um, increasingly um, insurances are putting restrictions on these testing and insurance may uh, uh, dictate, depending on the patient's insurance, which commercial laboratory you need to send these uh, testing to. But it is widely commercially available. So this is a uh, sample next generation sequencing report we often get. So a, basically what you get is that the top in any report, you get a summary of what um, you're detecting. So you get a, a statement that says pathogenic alterations are detected in IDH1 and NPM1 genes. And typically speaking, you, I will go over each of the key elements in the next slide, but typically what you get are genes that have a mutation, exons tested, um, what the alterations are, and what kind of effect it has on the gene, um, what the allele frequency is, and if if it's thought to be pathogenic, and you also get a list of genes that was analyzed. So the important things to note, take away from these um, um, NGS panel, number one, um, it's important to note uh, what genes are actually tested. It may seem kind of intuitive, but if you are not testing the gene, if, if the gene that you're looking for is not part of the panel and they're not commenting on it, it doesn't mean that it's wild type. It means that it wasn't tested. So it's very important to actually pay attention to what the panel includes. And if you're looking for a particular gene um, a mutation and if it's not part of the panel, then you don't have information for that gene. So it's very important to look at what genes are actually included in the panel that you're sending. Um, the exons tested, um, so if you look at the reports, um, it, tests, it tells you what part of the exons are tested. So a lot of times these testing are, doesn't cover entire exon of the whole gene. Um, it covers uh, typically a hot spot that um, are commonly found to have mutations. So if you're looking for a rare mutation that lies outside of that exon, then you may not have information. So you need to be aware that um, of what region of the actual gene it's uh, tested. Um, the genetic alteration, basically a mutation testing will give you the DNA change and a lot of times it leads to the amino acid change. Um, so that's an information you gather from these uh, testing. And um, with that, it, you get an information on what kind of mutation that you're predicted to have. And the different kind of mutations could be a point mutation for which you have one amino acid change. You may have insertion and deletion of certain chunks of uh, a gene or you may have single nuclear variant nu single nucleotide variants which may not matter as much and then you also get a percentage VAF, and VAF stands for variant allele fraction. Basically what that is is that in a next generation sequencing, you get a lot of reads for a region of, a, of, of interest, and you basically divide by the total amount of reads, and you, it's a gauge to see how, what percentage the reads you get are uh, confer that mutation. And then lastly, um, in a report, you, get, you often get a uh, classification of the mutation. You either get uh, a statement saying it's something that's pathogenic, benign, or variant of um, unknown significance. What that means is that basically uh, when you get a, a certain mutation, they look through known database of mutations like Cosmic and other databases. And based on that, um, they predict uh, what mutations may be pathogenic versus um, its uh, prediction predicted to be benign, or if you have a something called VUS, a variant of unknown significance, it's not something that has been previously been found. So what do you do with this information? Well, there's three ways and broadly that you can use this information. Um, number one, you can uh, think about uh, prognosis and it tells you something about uh, prognostic ways um, a patient may present with for AML. You can also talk about uh, molecular, mo you can mon use it to monitor response to therapy, which Dr. Robles will talk about. And like in the prior talk, um, you can actually target certain mutations and have um, inhibitors that actually uh, uh, have a clinical benefit when you target certain mutations like IDH1, 2, and FLIP3. So in this talk, I will mainly talk about prognosis because Dr. Robos will talk about the other fun stuff. So I'll talk about prognosis. 
So um, in general, this is a very simplified way we treat uh, AML patients who are uh, eligible for a transplant. So basically, you give, them, give patients induction chemotherapy, and hopefully a patient goes into remission. A big decision point is actually uh, in a young patient who are eligible for transplant, if you're going to consolidate them or consider them for a stem cell transplant. And generally speaking, um, uh, you, if you have a favorable um, risk profile, you consider um, consolidation with chemotherapy and everything else, you consider uh, stem cell transplant, assuming that you have a donor. This is a uh, updated um, classification of the Le European Leukemia Net, and the reason mutations matter is that um, they have prognostic implications. So in this uh, 2017 update of the ELN classification for AML, um, in the favorable category, um, not only are um, inverin 16 and uh, 821 translocations favorable, but mutated MPM1 without uh, FLIP3 ITD or low um, IT, FLIP3 ITD are favorable, and biallelic uh, mutated uh, CBP are considered favorable in terms of ELN classification. In terms of adverse um, risks, um, typically complex cytogenetics, of course, and monosomic carry type are bad, but also um, TP53, AXX01, NPM1, um, and uh, high FLIP3 are considered adverse according to the ELN classification. So uh, mutations are incorporated into uh, risk stratification for um, AML patients currently. So I wanted to touch briefly about a few of the mutations that have prognostic um, um, implications. So MPM1 is a, uh, a nucleocytoplasmic shuttling protein, and it mutation causes uh, dislocation of MPM1 protein, and it's the most commonly found uh, mutation in normal cytogenetic uh, patients with normal cytogenetics. And having an MP1 mutation is uh, predicted to have a favorable outlook. CBPA is a, a transcription factor and, and involved in myeloid differentiation, and you can have uh, mutations in the N-terminus and C-terminus, and it's found on about 10% of AML patients, and I'll go over what having these uh, mutations mean. So basically, when you have a mutated MPM1 and mutated CBPA, your survival matters. If you have either of these mutations uh, predicted survival in patients undergoing intensive chemotherapy with normal cytogenetics, do better than patients without these mutations um, um, in terms of survival and relapse-free survival. What is important to note about CBPA is that it's not any CBPA mutation. Um, if you have biallelic, as in if you have a mutation in the N-terminus and C-terminus, if you have a double mutation, then that is favorable versus if you have one mutation in CBPA, that's not really favorable. So that's something to note regarding the CBPA uh, mutation. Of course, in, like in any cancer, T53 mutation is bad. And in AML, T53 mutation is associated with complex cytogenetics. But regardless complex complex cytogenetics, um, independently, T53, having a T53 mutation is associated with poor overall survival, even uh, independent of complex cytogenetics. So having a T53 mutation confers a bad uh, outcome in AML patients. Also, um, in, in, in patients um, treated with intensive chemotherapy, having AXX01 and rung one mutations confer poor prognosis. And if you look at survival, um, uh, patients with AXX01 and rung one mutations have worse outcome. The problem with mutation is that it is complex. So left um, is a circular plot that we often see, and basically it's, a, it, it's each gene in a circular gene, and basically can draw a line to see uh, patients having co-mutations. And more than 80% of patients have more than two mutations. It's not like patients with AML have just one mutation, and, and you have to consider um, just prognostic implication of one mutation. It's very complex. A lot of patients have um, complex kind of mutations. And it's maybe a little intuitive, but um, having more mutations, may, you may have worse outcome rather versus having uh, fewer mutations. So it is, mutations are very complex and patients may have more mutations and it's not as simple as having one mutation you have to consider in AML. <laughs> 
Does having how, how much, uh, measuring how much of the mutation initially matter? Well, in FLIP3 especially, having um, not all FLIP3 mutations are created equal. If you look at patients with FLIP3 mutation, um, having a high amount of FLIP3, you can measure by um, ratio of um, uh, FLIP3 ITD versus wild type. If you have a high ratio, that confers worse prognosis. If you have a lower ratio, um, typically less than 0.5, it does doesn't have as bad of a outcome. And on the right um, is one retrospective analysis of one gene in particular, NPM1, where retrospectively, if you look at um, VAF of NPM1, if you have a high um, uh, more than 0.44 of NPM1 initially, you may have worse overall survival. The, the caveat to this is that this study did not account for MRD testing, but it is, um, it is one possible um, evolving area where uh, we may look at the mutational burden of um, AML patients initially and if how much that matters into prognosis. One common question actually is, um, can this, does this testing, how do you do this testing and do, do you have to do it in the bone marrow versus blood? This is a data from a Wash U group uh, in patients with AML and MDS treated with decidabine, and what they did was they looked at uh, they looked at bank serial specimens from blood and bone marrow, and they looked at um, patients who relapsed after decidabine and looked at uh, mutations, and they compared concordance between bone marrow testing and blood and. In, in their data set in AML and MDS patients, um, both uh, blood and bone marrow testing were concordant. So it is reasonable to test for these mutations in AML uh, patients, provided that you have active disease. So the following are my take home messages. So mutation testing is very important for determining prognosis in AML, among other things. Mutation testing uh, via NGS testing is commercially available and ideally should be done at diagnosis in AML because it provides prognosis testing. There is argument for repeated testing. Um, Dr. Robles will go over prognostic implications of MRD testing. And also when you have a relapse, if you have a targeted agent like IDH1 and IDH2, um, you, you may re, uh, there's rationale for retesting for mutation to see if you have acquired a targetable mutation. Um, mutation no, landscape is complex. Um, patients have more than one mutation usually, so it's very complex and not straightforward usually. And the one important key is that it can be done with blood and bone marrow. So I would again like to thank Dr. Coleman and the organizer for this meeting and Dr. Robos, and um, I'll take any questions at the end. Thank you.